Hello there, Tom. Good afternoon, are we on? Yes, we most certainly are. All right, no more swearing, okay, that's great. Yeah, um, obviously we're here in Ted, in uh, Tez Towers. Uh, a huge honour, a yeah. huge honour to be here. With, uh, with a gentleman many people have described as a behaviour guru, Tom Bennett. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, some people may know, you know, may know you as uh, kind of, you know, a, a columnist for columnist Tez mm. and uh, contributing to, you know, contributing many blogs to Tez.com. Uh, and, you know, additionally, now lately, the uh, government's uh, behaviour SAR. Yes, it's a promotion from Guru, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One up from Guru. Um, so, apart from that, give us a little bit of a, a, a background. Give, uh, give, give some of the teachers out a bit of a background. Um, sure, yeah. I, I came to London to seek my fortune after a, a, a very valuable degree in philosophy at Glasgow University. I started to work in bars, I ran nightclubs in Soho for six or seven years, which was obviously a natural progression into teaching. Mm -hmm. um, and when that started to approach burnout, when I was just about turning 29, 30, I went into teaching and it was the best career choice of my life. And so I've been doing that for about 13 years now. And also while I've been doing that, I've been running research ed conferences. Uh, coaching schools and behaviour, writing a lot about teaching and so on. So, so I, I'm kind of living the life of Riley just now. Ah, okay. Life, the life of Riley. Yeah, I'm getting to do all the things that I really love doing. I'm getting to teach. I'm still teaching. I'm still hanging on in there. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, I get to write about teaching, and I love writing. And also, I get to uh, work with new teachers a lot. So that's just you know, I couldn't ask for more. Oh, brilliant. And, and so, kind of tell us. Uh, what drew you to kind of the field of you know behaviour and classroom you know classroom management? <laughs> yeah, that's an easy one. I I became interested in behaviour through necessity because I was so appalling at it. I came like I say from nightclubs and I I had loads of confidence and I was really used to dealing with people and I just thought that how hard could it be being in a classroom teaching a subject you loved? Mm -hmm. um, boy, was I wrong. And in the first couple of years of teaching, I made I made every mistake that, that people could make, and and it really was a trial by fire. And it's something which I think is really important to keep banging out there that that it's it's possible to do really badly in teaching if you're not prepared to run a tough class, and if you're not prepared to really listen to what the kids are telling you, and also to to working on ways to get what you all need. So I spent a couple of years just drowning mm -hmm. in terms of behaviour management kids running about me like a totem pole and like I said I made all these mistakes and I, I was trying to be too nice to them and I, I tried to be you know really angry and mean and none of that worked and I really wanted to try and focus on what it was that actually made great behaviour in schools so I've, I went to every behaviour seminar I could go to I read every book that I could good and bad and I tried to distill as much as possible of that wisdom and also I watched as many teachers as I could mm -hmm. and I started to write more about behaviour and then I started to run the, uh, the behaviour Agony Uncle column for the test, which actually was really good for me too, because it meant that I had to reflect and think upon my own experiences and so on. So that was a great training ground, and I've been doing that for, for several years. And that then branched out into behaviour coaching and writing, eventually writing books about behaviour and so on. It's a constant learning process, and it's super important for new teachers particularly to realise. It's always a journey. You never reach the, 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 the perfect stage of behaviour management. You're never finished, you're never done. You're always working on it, always to get better. And I'm still learning things, even in classrooms today. Okay. Is there any bit, I mean, uh, was there any moment in particular, you said you had a couple of years where it was really, really difficult. Yeah. Was, it, was there one moment in particular which kind of really prompted you to think, right, okay, I've really got to get a handle on this? Um, yes, there were a few Rubicon moments for me. Um, I did, there was no kind of Dask Damascus moment where, you know, I thought, you know, I've got like Rocky running up the steps and anything. But two or three things happened. I remember once in my my second year of teaching, after dealing with a particularly hard class, a kid in my class just said to me, uh, you're not a real teacher, are you? And that was me after teaching for two years. And that was something awful. I used to, I'm sure a lot of teachers will, will, will uh, sympathize or, or will empathize with this. I used to go home so full of stress because I thought I'd done such a bad job that, um, and I'm not, I'm not ashamed to say this, you know, it used to make me weep occasionally with how stressed and upset I was because um, my classes weren't doing what I wanted them to do. They were learning as much as I thought they should. 
and you feel terribly guilty as a teacher because you're not, you know, because you, you blame yourself. So that was one thing. Another thing was, and I know it sounds really bizarre, <laughs> I don't recommend this for everyone, but I was quite seriously uh, beaten up one night coming home from, from, from uh, Regent's Park. I was walking through the East End of London and uh, it put me in hospital, fortunately, not, not for very long. And it kind of knocked half my teeth out, and it was, you know, it was a pretty horrible experience. And I remember how awful I felt at that time. I took a few days off school. And for some reason, that was a real pivotal moment for me because I remember thinking, I remember feeling so angry and so upset with the world and just impotent and helpless and all these kind of things. I remember suddenly realizing that if I didn't just let it go, if I didn't just stop blaming everyone else for my problems, I would, I would go nuts. And it's really weird, something clicked inside my head after that and I decided to try and rebuild myself as a teacher. So I had this kind of weird knock-on effect in lots of parts of my life, but that was a real moment for me. I know it's not really a classroom moment, but it was a really significant event for me and it related to my teaching. No, 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 I mean, you know. Sorry, that was a bit of therapy there for me. I just thought, <laughs> just thought, I'd, I just thought I'd unburden myself slightly. Well, no, we all live in the, live in the, the real world. I mean, you know, you take influence from uh, the outside world and yeah. bring it into your classroom. It was kind of inspiration, but from a very dark place, if that makes any sense. I think it was, I think it was also it was as low as I could go. Mm. And then I realised I couldn't go any lower, mm. uh, personally and professionally. And I thought, I've got to build myself up after this. No, it was good, and you did. Well, get that. <laughs> So, uh, going back to, back to the start, you were talking about kind of walking in, you know, kind of retraining after kind of coming out of nightclubs. Yeah. Um, and, you know, walking into class. As, as a newly qualified teacher, did you feel prepared? When, did you feel like there was enough preparation <laughs> for you to go into that, to go yeah. into that world, to go into the classroom yeah, and be sure, able to manage sure. it? Oh, that's an easy one. No, absolutely not. Here's a weird thing. If you ask most N most NQTs immediately after their training, have you received good training? They, t they tend to go, yeah, sure, because they don't know what they need by that point. Uh, and I would have probably said the same. I went to a really good educational training establishment and I got a 45, 50 minute lecture on behavior. That was in a year for something which is, to my mind, one of the three legs of the tripod of teaching, along with subject knowledge and pedagogy. And and I, I mean, this kind of links to my present work. I, I, I feel terribly, terribly strongly with the fact that that needs to change and we need to train teachers better. Um, the overwhelming paradigm is at the moment that you'll pick it up on the job. Mm. You won't necessarily pick it up on the job. If you go to a school that's not particularly good at training it, if you get a mentor who's too busy or too inexperienced to help you, you may not pick it up on the job. And you probably will pick up as the years go by. I did, after really focusing on it. But that's not really a model of best practice, I'm going to suggest. And we are throwing new teachers to the wolves if we don't give them some kind of better preparation. And some of this stuff can be trained. A lot of it is about interpersonal relationships and a lot of it is craft. And a lot of it is practical wisdom. And that, that has to be accrued on the job. But a lot of it can be uh, transmitted. Mm -hmm. You know, here's what I recommend you do. And also a lot of it can be practiced before you are thrown into, into classrooms. So, you know, it, it's very hard to know. We're not training teachers well enough. Yeah. So, I mean, are there any, since you've taken up your role with the, with, with the, with the government. Indeed. Um, have you been, you know, apart from the schools, the school that you're working in, have you, are you still, are you still seeing this when you go and go to kind of, you know, teacher training days? Um, so on and so forth. You're yeah. seeing the same the same things that you saw when you went into, uh, you know, when you were being trained yourself. Yeah, I I'm going to be honest. I don't think a huge amount has changed. I want to be absolutely clear. There are pockets of really good practice mm -hmm. everywhere. Um, I don't want to paint a picture of you know ITT being in a dismal state because that's totally unfair on the excellent providers that exist. There are some great schools that provide great training. There are some great um, HEIs which provide great, great training. But my problem is, is that the picture is still far too variegated, it's still too patchy. You can still go through teacher training and not necessarily have the tools to run a classroom. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that, can't be, that can't be right in the 21st century, one of the wealthiest nation, nations in the world, mm -hmm. where 
this is the weird thing. We have such high aspirations in education. I mean, this is not a country that doesn't focus on education. We're obsessed with it. Mm -hmm. You know, we really, really care. And yet we're still not getting it right. And part of it is because of this kind of slightly bizarre attitude towards running a classroom. I mean, you call it behavior management, but I just call it running a classroom mm -hmm. with all that that implies. It's not just about getting kids to sit up and look in the right direction, take the jackets off. Although that can be part of it. It's also about encouraging really great learning behaviours and encouraging habits in the children which will benefit them, not just in the classroom, but beyond the classroom. Okay. Um, talking about, I mean, you talked about kind of uh, uh, behaviour management, you know, behaviour management, general classroom. Yeah. classroom Call management. it behaviour management, that's fine. Behaviour management, classroom management. Yeah. Um, what are the mainstays in your class? If when you walk into a class and, and you and you want good behaviour, what? Uh, how do, how do you try to get it? Or how yeah, you... sure. I mean, it's interesting because I've I've been uh, helping to run the TS behaviour forum for so mm -hmm. long. Um, what's really interesting and perhaps obvious is that when people post a problem or when people when a new teacher says, right, mm -hmm. what do I do next? They're not looking for some long winded very abstract, you know, gaseous answer. They want mm. to know, what should I do tomorrow? What should I do in the next five minutes? What do I say to these kids? And while it's, I don't like to script things too much, I think there are some really uh, basic pieces of advice which you can kind of juice down for new teachers. Number one is you establish your high expectations and your boundaries with the children. You let them know that you really, really care about them. Mm -hmm. And you do that explicitly. I, I say to my classes, I really care about your well-being. You know, my name is Mr. Bennett, I'm here for you, I'm going to teach you X, Y, and Z. I really care about you. And in fact, I care about you so much that I'm going to set these boundaries and expectations for you. And we're going to do these so that we can all work really well together and achieve, and start to list what we're going to achieve and what we're going to do. Um, high expectations sounds like one of these rather draconian Tom Brown school days things. It's not. It's, it's telling the kids that you believe they can do excellent things. So if I set really high behaviour expectations, I'll always link that to very high academic expectations. I tell, for example, I tell the kids in my class that my expectation for them all is an A star, not because I think we're all going to get it, but because that's what I'm going to try for. So if I'm going to try for it, then I need them to help try for it too. But ultimately, as long as they do their best, that's 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 part of the uh, the, the main part of the other part of the deal. So set high expectations, set boundaries. You cannot run a classroom without the children knowing where they stand with you. Here's what I expect of you. Here's what you can expect of me. Mm -hmm. Um, don't just expect the children to be aware of these boundaries. They probably do, but they need to know that you know as much as they know that you care. And you show that you care by setting high boundaries and high expectations for them. So that's one thing. Second thing, that's, that's the kind of formal structural stuff. The second thing you do is um, you have to think really carefully and closely about how you encourage children to behave in ways which are better for them and better for the class. So you try and make sure you've got a really broad repertoire of interventions ready for children. That could be, you know, the classic detentions and phone calls home and so on. Obviously, these are, you know, your bigger guns. But also the little micro interventions that stops trouble before it happens. Whether that be, you know, tapping a student's desk or a coughing or mentioning somebody by name or giving a whole class instruction or by waiting for a few minutes for silence. Whatever. There's loads and loads of things you can do. These are the things that teachers need to be trained more in. So setting the formal structural boundaries with the high expectations, but then also working a lot on your interpersonal skills and how you convey things to the class. Those are the two really important things in terms of getting behaviour in the right direction. There are all sorts of other pedagogical considerations, like the type of lesson you teach, but there's a lot of rubbish talked about this, that if you plan a great lesson then the kids will behave. Planning a great lesson will help children behave, in the same way that planning a bad one will help them misbehave. But Make no bones about it. If they don't want to behave, you know, no amount of holograms and dancing bears will help you. So you really need to do. You really do really need to focus on the structural aspects of behaviour management too. And we, I mean, we just had a really. That was a really long answer. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, t I told you I was going to give you a, a juiced version of the answer, but it was just Webster's dictionary. I'm so sorry. That's all useful. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, we just had a question from uh, at Dr. D Armstrong. Um, which kind of leads on for this. Uh, sure. Is it is it better to focus on relationships rather than behaviour? <laughs> well, it's kind of a trick question that because behaviours are things that you can see people doing, and 
until we invent the Jedi mind trick or telepathy, we'll never be able to control children's minds, nor do we wish to. I just want to clarify that. <laughs> um, but what we can do is we can expect certain behaviours from children. Now, you use those expectations and you use that, that developing of habits with children as a means to develop a relationship with children. So, for example, I started a new school last year. Um, and what was really weird and really interesting for me as a so-called behaviour guru, which I hate, um, was to see how much of this gurudom was portable. And the answer is, you know, not a lot. Mm. The children don't know who you are, they're going to treat you like a brand new teacher. But what I found heartening was that it was reasonably, I was reasonably successful in getting them all on board reasonably quickly, probably a lot more quicker than when I first started, simply because I had... I knew what expectations to convey, I knew what kind of things I needed from them. I also knew what my reactions were going to be to them if they misbehaved. And these are all little micro expressions which can feed into building a relationship. But a relationship is such an abstract thing. You can't focus on it by itself. You don't go home and think, I'm going to work on my relationship with my wife. No, you think, I'm going to buy her flowers, I'm going to you know, ask her how she's doing, I'm going to take an interest in things that she's interested in, I'm going to try and help her achieve things. You know, you do specific things to try and work on a relationship. What you don't do is, you know, sit down with someone and say, I want to build up a relationship. Because that's 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 intangible and it's also kind of it's kind of false. So focus on the tangibles in other words. Focus on tangibles to make the intangibles happen. Intangibles are the description of how the tangibles worked. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Um I think he's uh also uh at Doctor D Armstrong's also kind of following he's up. He's busy. He's a busy man. Um, he, he also wants to know, is behaviour a euphemism for mental health in many settings? Right. Now that's, an, that's an interesting one. I have to think about that one slightly. But what I think he means is, are, are some misbehaviours or some you know, beha poor behaviour patterns, are they uh, a symptom of mental health? I guess, I guess the answer is it can be. <laughs> Um, and I think as a culture, not just as schools, but in terms of our general so uh, social culture, I don't think we focus enough on mental health. I think we brush it under the carpet. I think we pretend it doesn't exist. I think we're scared of it. And I wish as a society we talked about it more. And schools need to talk about it more too. I think that it's also something which is often brushed under the carpet at schools. There are, of course, some students who will exhibit misbehaviours because they have underlying mental health issues. But... To my mind, the vast majority of misbehaviours, particularly in mainstream settings, um, are as a result of very, shall we say, mainstream, broad spectrum, fairly you know, normalised motives. Things like the desire to get out of work, the desire to get a rise out of the teacher, the desire to be a bit naughty, the mm -hmm. desire to impress your friends, um, not understanding the work, and so on and so forth. I think those are the real drivers of most misbehaviour. I think seeing misbehaviour at schools as some kind of um, slightly sinister symptom of um, great oceanic undercurrents of mental illness is to over medicalize perfectly normal spectrum behaviours. So we want to try and avoid that while still being sensitive to the possibility that some of our children may be exhibiting well, I've, I, in my in my time as a teacher, I've seen children with depression, I've seen children with schizophrenia, uh, and, and all kinds of things. So yeah, it's it, there's a fine line to be walked there. Mm. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely agree with that. Uh, I would. Uh, we've just had Alex Griffiths uh, come in. Hello, with, Alex. Uh, hello, Alex. Indeed. Um, asking for uh, tips on behaviour slash classroom management. Uh, and building rapport for uh, co a cover supervisor, more specifically right, a cover yeah. su supervisor yeah. who's uh, new into the post. Right, that, that last bit you introduced at the end, that, that just tips everything into a whole new dimension. Cover supervisors of the world, I salute you, because you do a very hard job in very difficult circumstances. It all depends on the school culture, doesn't it? If the school is being led by a management team who've got a really strong sense of driving a learning culture and a, and a culture for behaving for learning. Then a supply teacher or a cover supervisor can come in and walk into a lesson, and as long as the lesson is of decent quality, deliver a great lesson. Mm -hmm. Because that's the culture and that's the expectation. However, many supply teachers do not walk into such perfect environments. However, what they need to do, and I've worked with a lot of supply teachers over the years, is they need, they need to kind of almost 
do everything that a teacher would normally do, but in microcosm. They need to do it really, really quickly. So, for example, the first two minutes of the relationship with the class is, is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. And this applies to anyone doing cover in general, uh, whether it be a, be a spy teacher or not. But the cover supervisor needs to walk into the classroom and, and instantly needs to convey the sense that A, this is a real lesson, this is a proper lesson, and B, the expectations will be high. Mm -hmm. That surprises a lot of children, particularly if the school culture is, oh, well, it's just a supply lesson, it's just a cover lesson, you know, it's playtime. And it's very easy, and I understand why many cover teachers sometimes feel like, oh, well, I'll just go with it for an easy life. Because they're not, because often the, the pay and the salary for cover supervisors and supply teacher is, 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 is terrible. And sometimes I think to myself, you know, why would they? try five times as hard to get a class behaving. But here, sorry, I'm, di I'm, I'm digressing massively here, but I do sympathise so much. Here's what they need to do. They need to establish in the first two minutes that the lesson matters. So, as much as is humanly possible, get the lesson ready. You know, have books out, have things on the board, have what, you know, be ready. Don't be the guy with the Tesco bag, fishing out a piece of white paper from the bin saying, I think this is your work. You know, try and get there early to the classroom, if you can, I know most do. Um, try and have a seat and plan. It might even just be boy, girl, boy, girl. I often say to cover supervisors, if you don't know the class, just get them to go boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl. You will then break up the, the social groups mm -hmm. just through randomness, through brownie in motion. Uh, and, and, and that will tacitly indicate to the class that you know, you're know you in charge of the classroom. And if they kick up a fuss about it, get, enlist somebody's help. I also recommend that they are aware of the school behaviour policy so they know what they can and can't do. I recommend that they, they know the name of the regular teacher. I recommend they know the name of somebody they can contact if they need in-class assistance and then do it. So they show the class they mean business. I recommend that they, they try and insist on as much as possible silence before they start the lesson, if they can. Uh, yeah, those are, those are kind of the, the broad tips, but that all needs to happen in two or three minutes if mm. possible. And also, here's what you need to do. If you have any pupils who really need some kind of post-class consequence, whether it be a phone call home or detention, I still am talking to, then you try and make sure that that happens, you pass it on to the classroom teacher, you pass it on to somebody, uh, because you might come back to that class, you might come back to that school, and if you're do even doing long term or mid term supply, you need them to know that you're not going to stand for any uh, any rubbish while you're there. So it's, it's a real toughie, you know, and you're not going to solve it in a lesson. Mm. But you, but you lay down the tracks so that the train can roll in, if at all possible. You do as much as you possibly can. You have to build relationships in such a small uh, window. Yeah, and I know a lot of supply teachers who've got like kind of almost like magic tricks. I, mean, I know some supply teachers who who should be sainted and knighted simultaneously, but who are just brilliant. They can come in and almost through sheer force of personality um, can just get the class. They might, you know, say something humorous, or they might, you know tell them something from the news in an interesting way. I don't recommend supply teachers have tricks, but, but most, of them, most of the good ones t tend to have like a repertoire of strategies which they've developed themselves. And they're usually kind of deflection or distraction techniques to then get the kids into the lesson. But what they really need to be doing is focusing on structure and boundaries and long-term building of relationships, but in a super fast time zone, in this tiny, tiny window. Yeah, it's hard work. Yeah, not easy, massively challenging. No, no, they deserve 10 times the salary, I assure you. <laughs> So, I mean, we're talking about people who kind of, you know, have, uh, have to do a lot in a very kind of short amount yeah, of time. Yeah, yeah. They're only 24 hours in a day. Um, you're incredibly busy at the moment as well, aren't you? Oh, not at all. I've got loads of time. No, <laughs> I, I am, I am the pr I'm a proud new father. Uh, and I do my teaching job and I write for the TES. I run research at the kind of research conference uh, organisation. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I do get lots of bits and pieces like that. I do a lot of behaviour training and speaking as well. So like I said, I'm, I am I am really, really blessed. Just I'm really, really fortunate in that I get to do things that I love every day of the week. It doesn't, it doesn't yeah. unfortunately, it doesn't mean that I'm doing it 24-7. I now sleep about 15 minutes a day. But... Um, I am super fortunate to be in a career that allows me these kind of possibilities. I love teaching, it's why I still do it. You know, I could leave the classroom and just focus on these kind of extracurricular stuff, but but I wouldn't want to. I, 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 I would miss it so, so much. I teach every week and I would miss the banter, I would miss the rapport, I would miss what it, what it gives you and I miss how much it grounds you as well. It's, it's probably the best job in the world. Great, fantastic. Um, Tom, it's been great having you in. Is that it? Wow, that was fast. Yeah. Okay, well, listen, that was, that was goes, a goes pleasure. Goes quickly, doesn't it? Um, thank you for coming in. No, thank you. And 
where, where can where can people apart from tes.com um uh, the new site and the magazine yeah um which is out tomorrow where can <laughs> where where um where else can we find you um romford no if you <laughs> if you really want me a while um you can get me on twitter tom bennett 71 which may or may not be my birth year and um, if you're interested in research we've got research ed one and on twitter uh, the Behaviour Forum and Tess Behaviour Forums is free to join. You can be anonymous. That's a really good place to say hi. Uh, but yeah, drop me a line, Sienna. Great. Well, thank you very much, Tom. My pleasure.